Margaret Preston, president of Power for Parkinson's. And today, in conjunction with our POP Profile series, we have Dr. Ray Dorsey with us, professor in the Department of Neurology, the Center for Health Technology at the University of Rochester. Dr. Dorsey, thank you so much for being with us today. Mar Margaret, my pleasure. Please call me Ray. <laughs> All right, Ray. Uh, if you like, we can get started allowing Ending Parkinson's, the book you co-authored, to really steer our dialogue um, on the front end of our questions. And then we can go from there if that works. Sounds outstanding. Great. Um, well, as we uh, kind of dissect the book and some of um, the really important um, notions that you've made, tell us about how as early as the 1960s, uh, neurologists thought by the 1980s, uh, Parkinson's was going to be obsolete. It was going to be it completely uh, eradicated and we wouldn't have to worry about it. Uh, tell us, give us a synopsis of that story as recently as the 1960s. And then tell me, do you believe the neurological community now views Parkinson's as really a mainstay versus, um, you know, just ex having been uh, here for just a finite period of time? Uh, so uh, it's only going to be a mainstay. It's only going to remain here if we uh, don't change uh, the dialogue about it. If we make our voices heard, Parkinson's is to a large extent preventable and we can prevent millions of people from ever developing the disease in the first place. That's like the central thrust. Can I read a little bit of the book? Of course you can, yes. Uh, so in 1961, a neurologist from all over the country gathered in Atlantic City, New Jersey for the 86th annual meeting of the American Neurological Association. They caught up with old friends, exchanged gossip on the boardwalk, and heard an intriguing I new idea from two Harvard neurologists, Dr. David Poskanzer and Robert Schwab. They argued that Parkinson's disease would disappear as a major clinical entity by 1980. The roots of their claim lay in Vienna during World War I. An Australian pilot named Konstantin von Economo, who had been stationed on the Russian front, returned to the city to resume his career as a neurologist. It was 1916, and his country needed him to care for wounded soldiers. In addition to attending to veterans with head injuries, von Economo saw patients with a strange new disease. The illness, which he described as a sleeping sickness, would strike individuals out of the blue. He observed that people were falling asleep while eating or working, frequently in a most uncomfortable position. After this, this abrupt onset of sleep, a headache, nausea, and fever followed. Many would go into a coma and die. Um, those who recovered often developed different symptoms months or even years later. They, developed, they included slow movements, stiffness, and tremors. They had, looked at, they had what looked like Parkinson's. The only difference were that these individuals were young and that a preceding infection had triggered the disease. Some were teenagers. For decades, they would remain in a physically frozen state, unable to move or communicate. And so these are the individuals that were featured in the movie Awakenings, um, talking about Oliver Sacks and the development of levodopa in the 1960s. And that when uh, Robert Williams, who portrayed Dr. Sachs, uh, gave this to patients, including Robert Nero, uh, as an actor, they had an awakening. They came out of this uh, Parkinsonian state. Unfortunately, for these individuals, the effects of uh, levodopa were transient and weren't lasting. Um, so these doctors thought all the people had Parkinson's due to uh, this environmental, I mean, due to this uh, infectious cause. Uh, they were wrong. And the person who pointed out that they were wrong was a woman. Mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Margaret Bone, uh, who's an associate professor at Columbia University at the time and wrote the most highly cited paper in the entire history of Parkinson's disease in 1967 uh, with, her, with her mentor, Dr. Melvin Yar, indicating that these individuals with sleeping sickness only accounted for about 5 to 10% of people with Parkinson's disease. And the vast majority had nothing to do uh, with this viral, uh, likely viral infection. And research later, again, a woman, uh, Dr. Caroline Tanner, uh, 20 years ago, demonstrated that the vast majority of Parkinson's disease is due to environmental causes, especially certain pesticides uh, and industrial chemicals, uh, this one widely used in dry cleaning and even decaffeinating coffee. Great. Thank you for that synopsis. So, and I like the how you preface, prefaced it with, it's only a mainstay if we let it be a mainstay. Yeah. So, <laughs> so it, is, we got to get rid of it. Yes. And, and we can. And if we don't, more and more people are going to have it. And, you know, from your father's experience and people, millions of people know from their own experience or from their friends and families, it is not a fun disease. Right. It's a debilitating disease. It's a deadly disease. It's the 14th leading cause of death in the United States. 100 people will die from the disease today. We need to change its course. 
I agree. Well, within the book, you've also proposed that PD really is a man-made disease, um, as we know, as we talked about some of the environmental factors. Um, Explain what you mean by this notion, especially relevant to our time as we think about pandemic, um, and we're all kind of familiar with that word, but tell me how Parkinson's has really become the non-infectious pandemic. Yeah, so uh, pandemics are just diseases that affect everyone. Um, They are growing. They grow in all parts of the world. And the vectors of uh, Parkinson's aren't viruses for the vast majority of the individuals. Uh, They are environmental toxins. So areas of the world that are most industrialized have the highest rates of disease. Uh, Areas of the world that are least industrialized, like sub-Saharan Africa, have the lowest rates of disease. And areas that are undergoing the most rapid industrialization have the uh, fastest increasing rates of disease. You're right. I think it's largely a man-made disease um, because these are products that we created. Like the poster child for man-made disease is lung cancer. So in the United States, lung cancer in the 1900s almost didn't exist. There was almost no lung cancer in the United States in 1900. And uh, it wasn't until the advent of cigarettes that 25 years after cigarettes were introduced in the United States, we saw a corresponding rise uh, in the uh, number of people with lung cancer. And I think you can see the same thing with industrialization, uh, certain pesticides, industrial chemicals, especially this one called trichloroethylene yes. and air pollution uh, are all linked uh, to Parkinson's disease. All of them are inhaled, all of them enter through the nose. Um, Parkinson's, as most of your listeners know, uh, 80% of people with Parkinson's have loss of smell. Mm-hmm. 95% of people's, um, 95% of people with Parkinson's, the first place you see the pathology of Parkinson's is in the smell center right behind our eyes, right above our noses. Mm-hmm. I think that gives us important clues to what's causing that Parkinson's Yeah. Well, within the same concept, um, I feel that you've impactfully compared the new carriers of the disease, such as urbanization and the widespread use of unhealthy products, which you've noted. Um, you really compared that to uh, bacteria spreading through traditional uh, pandemic. While it meets many of the criteria of a pandemic, including geographical extension, disease movement, um, explosive rates, among others, what do you think it will take for the world, uh, much as it did with COVID and pretty swiftly with COVID, to view it as a pandemic? Um, it'll take a 1.2 million Americans making their voices heard. Um, so in the 1930s, uh, polio shut down uh, swimming pools, shut down community centers, shut down schools, mm-hmm. uh, wreaked havoc uh, on communities. And people uh, created a march of dimes, uh, led in that case by President Franklin Delano Roosevelt, mm-hmm. raised money for a vaccine. 16 years after the March of Dimes, which began in 1938, uh, Jonas Salk had a vaccine that uh, prevented millions of people from uh, developing polio. Uh, Albert Sabin developed the vaccine shortly thereafter. We now live in a world that's largely free of polio. Uh, There are no polio treatment centers. There are probably very few polio experts uh, in the United States. Mm -hmm. We don't have to worry about treatments for polio. We don't even discuss it because it's largely eradicated. Yeah. We do the same thing for Parkinson's disease. We can have a world in future generations that's largely free of Parkinson's disease, where we don't spend $25 billion on Medicare yeah. for it, where 200 people aren't diagnosed with it uh, every day in the United States, and where it's not the world's fastest growing brain disease anymore. Yeah. Well, talking about environmental factors, we have to, of course, mention Paraquat, um, a pesticide linked to Parkinson's. Um, It's only increasing the use um, within the United States, while many other countries, as you've noted in the books, Sweden, Germany, Finland, have banned the chemical. Um, Despite Parkinson's foundations banding together, writing the letter to the Environmental Protection Agency, um, suggesting the link between Parkinson's and Paraquat, why do you think the EPA has essentially turned a blind eye on this link? we haven't had them held them accountable. Mm-hmm. Um, so Paraquat is the most toxic herbicide ever created. It was created in the 1950s. So just think about that. None of us drive cars or flying airplanes from the 1950s because right. we expect engineers to develop safer alternatives. Mm-hmm. And over 30 countries have banned Paraquat, including China. So there clearly are safer alternatives uh, to, to Paraquat. And England uh, bans the use of Paraquat, but exports it to Brazil, Mexico, and the United States. Mm-hmm. I mean, why is this acceptable? Yeah. Uh, it's been used to commit homicide, suicide, uh, kills the weeds that Roundup doesn't. It mm-hmm. increases the risk of Parkinson's by 150%. Uh, across the street from where I sit, um, my colleagues uh, 20 years ago demonstrated that when you feed Paraquat to laboratory and animals, they developed the clinical and pathological features of Parkinson's disease. Right. There is no environmental factor that has more evidence for its uh, link uh, to Parkinson's uh, disease than Paraquat. 
if the EPA reauthorized its use last year, we need to have the EPA ban of Aeroquat. Senator Cory Booker uh, has uh, introduced legislation that would effectively ban it. We should be telling our representatives and our senators to sign on to this bill so that we can live in a world that's Aeroquat free and live in a world where carbon disease is increasingly less common, not more common. Right. Um, within the book and really within the last um, couple of minutes that we've been talking, you've put a fire under our feet, you, the folks who are kind of in the Parkinson's business um, to stop passively awaiting, right? Responses, action, and kind of taking it on ourselves uh, to make action um, in, in terms of treatment and cure, but also you've encouraged us to be loud, um, not just within the treatment and cure, but also the advocacy, the public policy that you touched on. How can a person with Parkinson's or someone who's has a loved one with Parkinson's make, if they're sitting at their in, in their home uh, listening to us speak, how can they take action, um, really start accomplishing this um, uh, ownership and being loud with their singular voice? What suggestion would you give them? Um, so let's give you some things very tangible. One, right now, go to pdavengers.com, pdavengers.com and sign up to be a Parkinson's disease avenger. There are nearly 5,000 people from, I think, 50 plus countries and 80 plus organizations. It's a global grassroots organization led by Larry Gifford and other individuals with Parkinson's disease. Mm -hmm. Second, if they're in Central Virginia, they should join you and uh, your foundation uh, and your efforts uh, to spread the word. Three, they should uh, read our book, uh, Ending Parkinson's Disease. It's in your library. You can get it on Amazon. If you can't afford a copy, I will send you a copy for free. You just email me at info at ending PD. Uh, that board um, and tell your uh, representative to uh, sign on to Senator Cory Booker's bill to ban uh, Paraguay. These are all easy things. Uh, a little more radical, come join the Parkinson's Unity Walk uh, April 23rd in New York City in Central Park. Uh, it's free, uh, Parkinson's Unity Walk. You can just find it online. I'll be there uh, walking with hopefully 10,000, maybe 20,000 people with Parkinson's disease. And then uh, I have uh, colleagues who are just suggesting, why don't we have a march on Washington? Why not have a march on Washington? Let's get rid of paraquat. Let's get rid of trichloroethylene. Let's have uh, cleaner air for all of us to breathe in. Not only will we change the course of Parkinson's disease, we'll change the course of Alzheimer's disease, we'll change the course of cancer, and we'll uh, have a much healthier world for all of us. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. And just as a caveat, Power of Parkinson's is one of the P Avengers partners, and we're proud to be one. Um, we had the chance to speak with Larry Gifford, and he's really the the guy banning us all together, right? So we're all speaking the same same language and powers and numbers. So um, we appreciate his work um, with the PD Avengers as well. Um, as we move on to uh, PACT. Um, you referenced PACT, Preventing, Advocating, Caring, and Treating for Parkinson's Disease. Um, in the postscript of the book, you, re you referenced the PACT prescription and its positive impact really as it was used for COVID. So share with us the lessons we learned through the COVID pandemic and how we can implement those uh, to deal with the Parkinson's pandemic. So the first response to any pandemic or any crisis is to contain the first response is to contain it. So if there's a fire, you shut the doors. You don't allow any more oxygen uh, to go in. Mm -hmm. If it's a virus, you uh, get a shot in your shoulders uh, so that you and your community uh, stay uh, healthy. And right now, we're not doing anything to contain Parkinson's disease. We're fueling it. Yeah. It's kind of odd. It's the world's fastest growing brain disease. And who's being held accountable for this? Mm -hmm. Only people who are being held accountable are those with the disease. And they're suffering a lot um, and their families and friends are suffering a lot. We need to prevent future individuals from getting the disease. If we think we're gonna get through this by a cure, that's not gonna happen. We don't cure COVID, we don't cure heart disease, we don't cure Alzheimer's disease. We cure very few cancers. Three people in the entire world have been cured of HIV, but we can prevent HIV, we can prevent cancer, we can prevent heart disease. Uh, I think we can probably prevent uh, Alzheimer's disease. If we take actions now to make our world I have clean air, clean water, and clean food, we won't be suffering with Parkinson's disease in future generations. And oh, by the way, just because your father had Parkinson's disease or your uh, brother has Parkinson's disease doesn't mean that you are exempt uh, from getting Parkinson's disease in the future. So there's a lot of self-interest to be had in addition to giving a gift for future generations, a world that's largely free of Parkinson's disease. Yeah. 
Very well said. Definitely. Um, you know, despite Parkinson's being the fastest rising neurolog neurological disorder, and I think that would surprise those people who are not in the business realizing it is the fastest neurological uh, rising neurological disorder, um, there is a considerable disparity, unfortunately, with national funding. Um, in your opinion, what is causing that disparity? Through much silence. Uh, so in the 1980s, there was a, a virus that was affecting uh, communities in New York City and San Francisco. It was rapidly and uniformly fatal. There was an absence of federal response in that a group of activists uh, led by the late Larry Kramer formed an organization called ACT UP. And ACT UP model was silence equals death because for people with HIV, silence equals death. If they didn't make their voices heard, there was not going to be a federal response. There weren't going to be new treatments. There weren't going to be new clinical trials. There wasn't going to be as investigations into the epidemiology of the study. And because of their heroism, heroism in the 1980s, we live in a world where HIV is preventable and where HIV is treatable. And that happened again in the span of about 15 years. Yeah. The development of uh, ACT UP to effective treatments for the disease. So we know what the way we can do that. Um, just to give you a sense of the uh, funding gap, at the same time that the uh, number of Americans with Parkinson's disease has increased uh, 35% in the last 10 years, NIH funding, National Institutes of Health funding, research for Parkinson's disease adjusted for inflation has actually decreased. Mm -hmm. At the same time that 35% more Americans have the disease, NIH funding has actually decreased adjusted for inflation. We spend $250 million a year on research for Parkinson's disease from the NIH. Medicare spends 100 times that much, $25 billion a year, caring for people with Parkinson's disease. You can either invest on the front end or pay on the back end. Right. I think it's far more advantageous to invest on the front end. We live in a world that's where Parkinson's disease is, again, extremely rare, and we don't have millions of people uh, suffering with the disease. Most definitely. And uh, you've noted a few during our conversation and several um, examples within the book where we've seen it time and time again, um, how quickly things can be eradicated or the trajectory of a disease can change because of the loudness of people and people stepping up and stepping forward and not being silent. So um, it's great examples. And it's kind of like, why not? Why can't we recreate that same recipe for Parkinson's disease? Um, Ray, I'd like to move on to our second part of our questions as we talked more generally um, about the disease. Um, I'd like to ask, what do you believe if, as upon, upon someone's diagnosis is the first line of treatment um, who's new, newly diagnosed with Parkinson's disease? Um, so if you have a Parkinson's disease you know, or if you don't want to get Parkinson's disease, you got to exercise. Um, so numerous studies have demonstrated that exercise is beneficial for people with the disease, whether that exercise is Tai Chi or running or yoga or bicycling or ballroom dancing. Um, it's beneficial. If you want to get enough that makes you sweat a little bit. I routinely recommend that my patients can at least an hour a day of exercise. Uh, Dr. Boss Bloom, senior author on the book, has I've released some uh, research showing that um, that exercise likely releases growth factors in the brain. These growth factors are necessary to maintain connections in different parts of the brain. So you won't, by the time you get Parkinson's disease, 60% of your dopamine producing nerve cells have died off. You want to protect those remaining 40%. Mm -hmm. Exercise is a great way uh, to doing that. Um, after you exercise, you know, there are um, medications levodopa being the most effective treatment uh, for uh, Parkinson's disease. So the first thing you want to do is uh, exercise, especially if you're younger with Parkinson's disease, you know, you're going to have it for a very long time. Yeah. You want to do everything possible to potentially slow its progression. Absolutely. I love that that was your first answer. Of course, there's our, our medica medication component, but a lifestyle change is really uh, so very important in terms of being active and exercising. Um, what would you say is the biggest barrier to advancements in treatment options, as well as ultimately unlocking the cure to Parkinson's disease? I, I think we get caught up on cures. Um, you know, we don't cure very many things. You know, we can cure a few things with surgery. We don't cure things. Think about, you know, 60% of the nerve cells are died off. What's the cure? Yeah. I'm going to regrow the nerve cells. I mean, that's just, I think we have to be really think that the best way to do this is to prevent the disease. Now, if you have the disease, we need better treatments, uh, 100%. So the key there is I think we need better measures of the disease. You know, right now, if you go to clinic, you see someone like me, you, I, we have you tap your thumb and index finger as big and fast as you can 10 times. And that's how we tell if you're getting better or worse or if a drug works or doesn't work. Mm -hmm. That's not going to get the job done. 
you know, we have supercomputers around with us uh, that measure us, you know, our gait, our walking, and our activity. Uh, we have devices that can be put into the home. Um, we might have imaging or other markers in the blood uh, or in the skin that could tell us. When we get better measures of the disease, objective measures of the disease, we'll be able to tell whether new treatments work. We'll be able to tell whether those new treatments work in a shorter period of time with fewer number of participants at lower cost. So the first key, I think, to getting better treatments and getting better measures of the disease, better measures to get better treatments faster. Absolutely. And that all, of course, hinges on our uh, investment, right? And in terms yeah. of search and dollars. million dollars is not going to get it done. Which you're and by the way, you know, pharma is not going to invest if there have been no therapeutic breakthroughs for Parkinson's this century. So again, there have been no major therapeutic breakthroughs for Parkinson's this century. Pharma is not going to invest unless they can see a path forward and we need better measures so that we can encourage investment so we get a greater success rate for developing that. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, Parkinson's is often considered to be synops, uh, really a synonym for a tremor, right? Uh, we all think of Parkinson's equals a tremor and there's not much else, but we all know there's such a myriad of symptoms and everyone has it differently. So share, if you can, um, a, a symptom that you, if you could cast a light on, uh, what symptom would it be that also is um, part of Parkinson's disease? I think if we re this, uh, redefine the Parkinson's, I think we would say loss of smell mm -hmm. um, would be a core feature of the disease. Now, it's not necessarily the most disabling thing. It's not as disabling as depression. It's not as disabling as dementia. It's not as disabling as hallucinations. It's not as disabling as lots of other features of the disease. But it's uh, almost found again, 80 plus percent of people. It happens 10 years or more years before people develop tremor or slowness of movement. So if we had effective treatments, you could actually prevent people who might be at high risk for developing the disease, right. intervene earlier and prevent uh, their progression. Right. I think it provides us a really important clue as to what's causing Parkinson's disease. Normally the brain is very protective. It has a very effective blood brain barrier, which prevents toxins and viruses from getting in. Mm -hmm. I think most of the environmental risk factors are inhaled. They're going in through a trap door, a front door. Mm -hmm. Right under our not right under our noses and you know, bypassing the normal protective mechanisms, kind of like COVID, and uh, causing uh, an early symptom of the disease and early pathology uh, in the smell centers of our brain. Mm -hmm. I think that's telling us a lot about uh, what's causing the disease and give us a key to identify people early in the course of the disease. So we can have them exercise or develop other treatments to prevent uh, the onset of the disease in those individuals. Right. Right. There's a lot of uh, exciting research. Of course, we do need additional funding as we touched on, but there is a lot of exciting research being done within the world of Parkinson's disease. What are some of the project and research um, endeavors that you're most excited about right now? We're investigating, I'm sorry, to be selfish, we're investigating a cluster of individuals uh, who we think may have Parkinson's due to exposure to this a very simple chemical called trichloroethylene or TCE. This chemical is just six atoms big, uh, was widely used in the 1970s and everything from decaffeinating coffee, sank if you drink the sink in the 1970s, it was found in correction fluid like whiteout, found in carpet cleaners. Uh, 10 million Americans worked with the chemical, predominantly in decreasing military, semiconductor industry, uh, solvents, painters. Um, and two pounds per person of this chemical uh, were used uh, in the United States. Uh, found in dry cleaning sites, and we're evaluating a cluster of individuals who work right near a contaminated dry cleaning site with this chemical. And the chemical like radon can evaporate from the, the ground, the soil and groundwater, and enter people's homes, workplaces, and schools undetected. And we think people may have been breathing this in for years and developed a high rate, not of just Parkinson's disease, but of uh, cancer. I think if we find what's causing the Parkinson's disease, we can just get rid of it. Yeah. Or we can clean up these sites. We can test people's homes, schools, and workplaces that work near uh, potentially contaminated sites, prevent them from ever developing Parkinson's, prevent them from ever developing multiple myeloma, prostate cancer, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, renal cell carcinoma, and a bunch of things. So I think if we invest more in the prevention of the disease, uh, we'll do that. It's worth noting that the woman who started the, the pink ribbon was actually a woman who started with the peach ribbon. Mm -hmm. And she did it because her mother and sister had a, I had died of breast cancer and um, she uh, she uh, pinned her initial uh, peach ribbon uh, to a simple card that she made up in her home. I'll just read it to you in a second here. Um, 
Charlotte Haley was a 68-year-old housewife living in a sprawling suburb of Los Angeles. She picked up her meg own megaphone. Both her older sister and her daughter have been diagnosed with breast cancer uh, in the 1980s, and she was frustrated by the lack of progress against the disease, especially the scarcity of funding for prevention. So she started a grassroots campaign in her dining room. There she began making little hoops out of peach colored ribbons. She packaged five of them together and attached a postcard with a simple message. The National Cancer Institute's annual budget is $1.8 billion. Only 5% goes for, for, for cancer prevention. Help us wake up legislators in America by wearing this ribbon. Yeah. And so unless we start investing in preventing the disease, just like we do with COVID, you know, we don't have a cure for COVID, but we have great ways of preventing people from ever getting the disease uh, in the first place and treatments to prevent people from getting sick uh, or getting hospitalized once they are infected. It's much easier to prevent these diseases than it is to cure them. Yeah. Breast cancer being a fantastic example. If I can elaborate on the TCE, um, is it going to take this same public policy? Share with our listeners what it's going to take to ban TCE. Is it going to be pretty similar to the efforts being made with Paraquat? Yeah. So the EPA has proposed banning TCE. Uh, the EPA says it's a carcinogen by all routes of exposure. It, it was developed in the 1920s, so no one would fly in an airplane or drive in a car from the 1920s. We knew known about its uh, toxic effects since 1932. Yep. It contaminates uh, half the Superfund sites uh, throughout the United States, it contaminates thousands of sites in the state of Michigan alone. I know of three to four sites uh, in Rochester, including one 15 minutes from where I live and what, another one 10 minutes uh, from where I live. Um, my guess is there are sites near your listeners. It's been found to have evaporate into people's kids' schools, uh, daycare centers, um, workplaces, uh, and homes. And people breathe it in unknowing it for years. And then 10, 20, 30, 40 years later, uh, develop uh, Parkinson's disease. So we need to ban it. Um, we have safer alternatives. Companies advertise safer alternatives. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, other countries have banned it. And we need to clean up the sites that are contaminated and really prevent people from can, 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 can contaminate sites prevent it from going into people's homes. And it, just like we have radar mitigation systems in people's homes, we can have the same thing for TC. Right. And I hope what you said resonates not only to our PD community, but also those who are not impacted by the disease, because we all have kids at school, daycare, all of these other sites that while you're thinking from afar, you can look at PD and you've got the distance, you might not have the distance in 20, 30 years because it is touching um, all of our daily living spots. So I hope what you said resonates with an entire community, not just a PD community. And on the daycare front, so uh, I mentioned dry cleaners are a major source of contamination. Dry right. cleaners are in strip malls, and many daycare centers are in strip malls. So you could have your kid be going to a daycare center next to a dry cleaner that's contaminated the underlying uh, ground, soil underneath it, and your kid could be breathing CCE right. uh, for years. And this isn't like some hypothetical thing. Camp Lejeune, a marine base in North Carolina had the most contaminated TCE site uh, for 25 years. The Marines covered it up. Brian Grant wrote in his book that when mm -hmm. the NBA basketball player with uh, Parkinson's disease, uh, you know, he lived at Camp Lejeune when he was three years old and he was drinking and breathing in uh, TCE right. when he was a child. Uh, you've touched on some of the ways we can get involved, but share as we conclude with our listeners um, where they can learn more about um, you, your efforts with Ending Parkinson's, not only the book, but um, action, uh, your research, and how they can learn more about the Center for Health and Technology at Rochester. Join PD Avengers. We got to change the course of disease. I can't think of a better gift for future generations than one that's free of uh, disease. I mean, what a great thing to do that. We live in a world that's largely free of polio. We live in a world where HIV is preventable and treatable. We live in a world where drunk driving is socially unacceptable. These are all gifts we inherited from previous generations. It's mm -hmm. time for us to reciprocate. Let's make the world free of Parkinson's disease or largely free of uh, Parkinson's disease in the future. To the extent it's environmentally caused, man-made, we can do so. Join PD Avengers, pdavengers.com. Uh, uh, buy our book. All of our all the authors are uh, devoting all of our proceeds to efforts to end uh, Parkinson's uh, disease. If you have questions about the disease or you can't afford the book, yeah, email me at info at endingpd.org. I'd be delighted to hear from you. Fantastic. That's a lovely way to uh, end our, our talk on. So Dr. Ray Dorsey, thank you so much for spending time with Power of Parkinson's. Margaret, thank you very much for all your great work and uh, good luck to you and your foundation and to your father. 
Thank you.